Hello friends, Dr. Shunali here. Let us uh, do the OBSCANI discussion from grand test number 179. All right. So moving on to the grand test questions here, beginning from question number 132. Now question number 132 asks, the laboring patient has progressed through labor without any analgesia. She pushes effective and brings vertex to the perineum. Effective anesthesia will be needed for an episiotomy repair. Where should the needle be placed? All right, so we have to give an episiotomy. All right, an episiotomy we have to give at the perineum. The nerve supply of the perineum and in a uh, nerve supply of the perineum is from the pudendal branches all right now remember that when you give an episiotomy only local infiltration of the area right only local infiltration of the area by local anesthetic is enough for the anesthetization of that particular area where we are going to give the episiotomy. So that is good enough. So the needle should be placed through the perineum, okay, because the, it, we have to anesthetize the cutaneous branches of the pudendal nerve. Now another very important aspect is you have to remember that when we talk about the nerve supply of the vulva, the nerve supply of the vulva is from three sources, all right. So anteriorly it is the ilioinguinal and the ilio hypogastric nerves right and then uh, the middle part of the vulva is supplied by the cutaneous branches of the pudendal nerve and posterior inferior part of the vulva where we are actually giving the episiotomy is supplied by the posterior cutaneous nerve of thigh right Poster cutaneous branches from the posterior cutaneous nerve of thigh right so these are three different nerves okay three four different nerves which and branches from the lumbar and sacral plexus both which are supplying the perineum all right so we have to understand that we have to anesthetize a a number of branches right so that is best achieved by giving local infiltration of anesthetics so that the local area the branches are anesthetized if you give into the hypogastric plexus come on for episiotomy why will you give some block in the hypogastric plexus into the uterosacral segment ligament nonsense where which which nerve will you anesthetize there in the uterosacral ligament what which nerve is there so hardly anything there the confusion could be between A and D through the sacrospinous ligament. Through the sacrospinous ligament, we can anesthetize this, this nerve piercing the needle through the sacrospinous ligament. This is done for pudendal nerve block. Okay, this is done for pudendal nerve block. Now, pudendal nerve block can be given when we are doing procedures deep into the vagina, right? Because the lower half of the vagina is supplied by the pudendal nerve, all right? So pudendal nerve can be given like for example, when we are giving forceps or vacuum, an instrumental delivery or we are suturing high in the vagina, right? Then we can give the pudendal nerve block. But to give an episiotomy, we need a local infiltration because we have to take care of the cutaneous branches and the cutaneous branches in the vulva are not just from the pudendal nerve they are also from the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh right and if you are anesthetizing the pudendal nerve block only we are not dealing with the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh so that is why during episiotomy it is supposed to be through the perineum Moving on to the next question, question number 133. Okay, now this is a long question and I'm sort of hiding uh, the, X for the options, but let me just read it out to you and I will keep moving this up, okay? Now, a 42-year-old primary gravida has noticed an increasing number of spidery veins appearing on her abdomen. She is upset with the unsightly appearance of these veins and wants to know what you can get recommend to get rid of them. What do you tell this patient? You tell this patient that it's a very serious condition. She should take a referral from a vascular surgeon. You tell her that you are concerned she can have a serious liver disease. You tell her 
to go to a dermatologist or you tell her that the appearance of these vessels is a normal occurrence in pregnancy and will resolve spontaneously after delivery. Now these spidery veins, these palmar erythemas, these are obviously a sign of liver disease, right? Or could be some, uh, uh, the, the, it could be uh, some dermatological condition. But remember that in pregnancy what happens, there is a lot of progesterone in the female's body and this increase in progesterone in the female body causes vasodilation. This progesterone causes vasodilation and that causes the dilatation of these uh, veins. So we can have those palmar erythemas, the spidery veins on the abdomen. And even though there are these increased vasodilatation causes the spidery veins over the breasts also. So these are normal physiological changes of pregnancy which will get resolved once the pregnancy is over. So she just needs to be counseled that she need not worry. So the answer for this question is option number D. So do not get hassled by seeing a very long question once you read through it most of the long questions are actually the simpler questions now question number 134 Question number 134, a postmenopausal woman presents with pruritic white lesions on the vulva. Punch biopsy of representative area is obtained. Which of the following histological findings is consistent with the diagnosis of lichen sclerosis? So the correct answer for this is A, blunting or loss of rete pegs. All right, so lichen sclerosis basically in lichen sclerosis, there is no atrophy, okay? So what happens is basically bunting or loss of rete pegs. And it is not in lichen sclerosis, is not an acute inflammatory condition. It is not a chronic, uh, you know, itching conditions which will lead to thickened keratin layer. So basically the histological appearance is the bottom line, the bottom line is blunting or loss of rete Pegs. And lichen sclerosis is also a pre-malignant condition for the vulva, alright? So it is also a pre-malignant condition for the vulva, for vulval cancer, okay? Now this is more like a dermatology question but obviously it's given here so we can answer this question from here itself. Now. Moving on to the next question, question number 135, the type of placental insertion shown, what is this type of placental insertion? So you can see this is the whole body of placenta and the cord is attached here instead of in the center of the placenta. So this cord is attached here in the, but remember, remember that this cord is attached at the margin, but still attached on the substance of the placenta margin of the placenta but still attached in the substance of the placenta and this is called as a battle door placenta. It is called as a battle door placenta. The complication this could be you are delivering the placenta and the cord can get avulsed and lead to postpartum hemorrhage. A velamentous insertion, do not confuse with this velamentous insertion. A velamentous insertion would be the placenta is like this and these are the membranes and the cord is, is, is dividing and inserting on the membranes. So this would be a velamentous insertion. This is a velamentous insertion where the cord is still attaching on the periphery, right? But not to the substance of the placenta. The cord is inserted on the membranes at the margin, right? So this is the difference between a battle door and, and a velamentous placenta. Sometimes this velamentous placenta, very, very important remember that this velamentous placenta can be associated with a condition called as vasa previa, right? Can be associated with vasa previa. If this placenta was in the lower uterine segment, then these, uh, this, uh, this membrane or this placental attachment can lie directly overlie the internal os, right? So placenta in the lower segment, in the os, the placenta in the lower segment, and this 
uh, unsupported vessels, right? This vessels which are attaching on the membranes are actually just overlying the internal loss. When the os will open, membranes will rupture, which structure will bleed? The fetal vessel. So this condition called as vasa previa can lead to fetal bleeding, can lead to fetal bleeding and exsanguination and can be very, very disastrous for the, the fetus can lose a lot of blood in a, in a very short span of time and can be very life threatening for the baby until less uh, emergency cesarean is done. All right. So, velamentous insertion of the placenta can be associated with vasa previa can lead to fetal bleeding. All right. And circumvallate is uh, circumvallate placenta is when the placenta has a thick rim of this is the placenta, this is the cord, and the placenta has a thick white rim. Placenta has a thick white rim of folded amnion and chorion overlying it. Now remember that with battle door placenta, with velamentous insertion of placenta, these conditions can give rise to battle door placenta can give rise to PPH, can lead to PPH. But the circumvallate placenta leads to APH and abortions, okay, APH and abortions. All right. Moving on to the next question, question number 136, identify the disease. So what are we seeing here? We are seeing here this is the ovary and there are multiple small, small follicles, multiple small, small follicles arranged around the periphery, some in the center also. This is PCOS classic PCOS, all right. So, PCOS can be diagnosed on the basis of the Rotterdam's criteria. There is a Rotterdam's criteria for the diagnosis, very, very important criteria. Remember, right, Rotterdam's criteria for diagnosis of PCOS, okay. Two out of three, if present, should be giving, making the diagnosis of PCOS. So, the first is the uh, oligomenorrhea or a minoria, right? The second is clinical or biochemical evidence of hirsutism, sorry, hyperandrogenism, hyperandrogenism. And the third is polycystic ovaries. Polycystic ovaries are defined as more than equal to 12 follicles in either ovary. So, a single ovary can be polycystic and the other ovary can be normal that will also satisfy the Rotterdam's criteria. So only two out of three is needed remember. So remember that a woman can have oligomenorrhea and hirsutism but have normal ovaries. She will still be labeled as PCOS. A woman can have oligomenorrhea and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound then she will and she has no clinical evidence of hirsutism, there is no clinical evidence of hyperandrogenism, there is no hirsutism, there is no increased testosterone, right? Even then she would be polycystic ovaries. So remember some very, very important things. Remember some very, very important things about diagnosis of PCOS is done by the Rotterdam's criteria. Two out of three should be present. So if oligomenorrhea is there, if hirsutism is there, or there is increased testosterone and the polycystic ovaries are not there, the ovaries are normal, then also she will be labeled as PCOS. So ovaries can be normal in PCOS, all right, and 25% of normal women who do not have PCOS can have polycystic ovaries. So, a woman has polycystic ovaries, but she does not have oligomenorrhea, her cycles are regular, her serum testosterone levels are normal, clinically she has no evidence of hyperandrogenism in the form of hirsutism as well, she's all okay, and she has just has polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, then she is not PCOS, okay. So, ovaries can be normal in PCOS, 25% of women, normal women can have polycystic ovaries. 
polis, PCOS women are usually obese, okay, they are usually obese, but thin women, thin women can have PCOS also, so weight is not a criteria, weight is not a criteria, then the LH is raised in PCOS, LH levels are raised in PCOS, but this is, but this is not diagnostic, okay. So raised LH levels can be there in PCOS, but these are not diagnostic. For the diagnosis of PCOS, we need for diagnosis, what do we need? We need raised androgens in the form of serum testosterone that is the most important. So raised androgen levels are used for the diagnosis of PCOS, all right, not raised LH. LH is also raised but it is not a diagnostic criteria, all right. So these are the four or five important points about PCOS which you need to remember. Question number 137, during a routine Antenatal visit and a, during a routine antenatal visit, an 18 year old G1 para 0, so an 18 year old primary gravida patient at 23 weeks of gestational age undergoes urine analysis. So she is 18 years, she is 23 weeks, and she is a primary gravida. The dipstick done by the nurse indicates the presence of trace glucosuria. Trace. All other parameters of the urine tests are normal. So there is no protein, there is no infection, there is no bacteria. Which of the following is the most likely etiology of the increased sugar detected in the urine? So yes, A, patient has diabetes. A, patient who is having diabetes can definite, will definitely have urine in the glucose. But, but remember they are asking which is the most likely etiology. She is a primary gravida, young 18 year old female in 23 weeks of gestation. The patient's urine analysis is consistent with normal pregnancy because normal in pregnancy the renal threshold for the excretion of glucose is decreased. Alright, so the renal threshold for the excretion of glucose is decreased. So even in normal pregnancy, most of the women can excrete these trace amounts of glucose in their urine. That does not mean that the patient has diabetes. So most likely this is a normal urine analysis consistent with normal pregnancy. But yes, it could be diabetes. It could be diabetes. So this woman a woman who has glucosuria in pregnancy, we do not want to wait any further to go for diagnostic tests for gestational diabetes mellitus. So earlier on it was said even in the western literature, even in the textbooks like Williams which the American people are writing, they are mentioning to do uh, uh, screening for GDR at 24 weeks. But the latest government of India guidelines and what we are routinely doing in clinical practice nowadays is testing for GDM early on in pregnancy in the first antenatal visit itself. Okay, in the first antenatal visit itself, we are doing the testing for GDM because Indian population is prone to insulin resistance, is prone to diabetes mellitus. So Indian women in pregnancy, all women are screened. Remember, this is a very, very important point to remember about GDM screening, about GDM screening in pregnancy. Very, very important in our population, very, very important. We are screening all women, okay, primary, multi, obese, thin, family history, no family history. Now, we are screening all women, all pregnant women are screened and when as, as early as the first antenatal, first ANC visit, we are screening in the first ANC visit itself. If her first ANC visit is at 12 weeks or at 14 weeks, we are doing the test, okay, we are doing the screening. If 
the screen is at if she her first visit is at 24 weeks fine we are screening at 24 weeks so if her first visit has been at 12 weeks or 14 weeks and then she comes out to be positive then she is managed at gdm if the first visit if at first visit she comes out to be negative what do we do it's for example her first visit as at 12 weeks or let's say let's say 14 weeks was her first visit this is the usual time so exam in example if at 14 we, we uh, if at 14 weeks we are doing her oral glucose tolerance test okay oral glucose tolerance test then if she is negative in the first visit we will do a repeat test at 24 to 26 weeks okay so indian guidelines the government of india guidelines are saying screen all pregnant women screen in the first antenatal visit itself all right and if the screening is positive then you start treatment for gdm because now we are doing only the single step or uh, one step test two step test they are not recommending they are saying the one step ogtt should be used okay which we are giving 75 gram ogtt and we are doing two hour two hour value after the 75 grams if it is more than 140 gram percent then this means that it is a positive screen all right and then you have to treat for gdm so this is the government of india guidelines if in the first visit her uh, screen is negative she needs to be we need to go for a repeat test at 24 to 26 weeks okay so that is about the gdm screening moving on to the next question question number 138 Intrapartum automated fetal electrocardiography has the advantage over conventional cardio tocography. So, what is conventional cardio tocography, which we have studied in our lectures, which have studied in our classes, which we routinely see in our labor rooms? That is conventional cardio tocography, a probe placed on the maternal abdomen, which is on one hand, we are getting the uh, uterine contractions and the, on the other hand, we are getting the fetal heart rate. So that is the conventional cardio tocography. What is a fetal electrocardiography? We introduce an electrode through the vagina, place it on the fetal scalp and it is like a fetal ECG. Okay, it is like a fetal ECG. So that is electrocardiography. This is something which we have not seen routinely in our labor rooms. We do not use it. Okay. So, what is the advantage of going for such an invasive testing, such an invasive method? Does it improve neonatal outcome? Does it decrease the cesarean section rate? Okay. Does it decrease the need for fetal blood sampling during liver or all of the above? What is the advantage? So, does it improve neonatal outcome? Well, if it would have uh, increased neonatal outcome, we would have been using that instead of using the conventional cardiotocography, but that is not the case. We do not use it. So, improving neonatal outcome is the false statement. Does it decrease the cesarean section rate? Well, if that would have been the case, we would have been using it instead of using the conventional cardiotocography. So, it does not decrease the rate of cesarean section. So, uh, this is also false statement. So, Answer is not A, answer is not B, B all of the above is not the answer. So simply by excluding the statements, we've come to the answer that it decreases the need for fetal blood sampling during labor. All right. So fetal blood sampling, uh, the need for fetal blood sampling has been reduced. So because earlier on what they said was that whenever the fetal heart rate is dropping on a conventional cardiotrochography, the uh, British people, the British guidelines, they write that they do a fetal scalp blood sampling. They take out uh, in because it's an invasive test again, fetal scalp blood is taken, tested for um, you know acidosis so fetal blood ph some and they are also using the fetal blood lactate levels and they are deciding based on the fetal ph fetal blood ph so if the fetal blood ph is acidotic that means that the 
fetus is now getting acidotic and can uh, is suffering for hypoxemia which has led to acidosis right and this fetus needs to be immediately delivered right so they were using this protocol right invasive testing once the cardiotocography showed a fetal heart rate deceleration they did not do an immediate cesarean section they would do it only when the fetus becomes acidotic the reason they, they advise to do this is to uh, do, do not do unnecessary cesarean sections all right do not do unnecessary cesarean sections but in our routine clinical practice we are not following this protocol we are not going for the invasive testing for the fetal sampling fetal blood sampling so to counter that a new test has been there there which is fetal electrocardiography instead see the effect of acidosis or hypoxia on to the fetal heart itself fetal ecg right so they said that we will do us just place a scalp electrode instead of doing the fetal blood sampling place a scalp electrode and then we will decide in which baby to do a cesarean section all right so that is the only advantage of the fetal electrocardiography and when studies were done which protocol is better should we go for the electrocardiography fetal ecg or we should continue with the practice which we are following in our own labor rooms so because there was no improve in neonatal outcome because it did not decrease the cesarean section rate the current standard of care is that we do a conventional cardiotocography only we don't do the invasive tests none of us has seen it i have not seen it you people have not seen in your labor rooms we are not doing this okay we are not doing fetal electrocardiography in routine labor rooms maybe for research purposes maybe but not otherwise because as such there is no direct benefit by doing that invasive test which is achieved all right so in a nutshell this is all that you have to tell you about this a little common sense even if you've not studied fetal electrocardiography you should be able to answer this question okay moving on to the next question question number 139 amniotic membrane contains what does amniotic membrane contains amniotic membrane does it contain blood vessels no it does not contain blood vessels amniotic membrane is avascular it is avascular it does not contain nerves also right so there is no nerves there are no blood vessels in the amniotic fluid membrane amniotic membrane is responsible for the tensile strength so it mainly contains collagens and it also contains glycerophospholipids it also contains glycerophospholipids this amniotic membrane is capable of using the phospholipids okay capable of using those phospholipids and producing prostaglandins out of them so amniotic membrane synthesizes these prostaglandins especially the prostaglandin e2 okay so that is what it is capable of but in itself it does not have uh, vessels it does not have nerves so this is an avascular membrane responsible for the tensile strength has collagens is capable of using the glycerophospholipids in these membranes and then these glycerophospholipids can be synthesized to prostaglandins question number 140 fundal pressure method for delivery of placenta is used when the baby is when the baby is premature when the baby is premature why see what is the what is the conventional method of uh, delivering a placenta the conventional method the usual method is controlled cord traction the usual method is controlled cord traction now in controlled cord traction we are lift uh, we are uh, on one hand from the from the from one hand we are lifting the we are applying pressure on the supra pubic region and lifting the uterus lifting the fundus of the uterus and from the other hand we are applying traction on the cord so if it is a thin cord if it's a thin friable cord like that seen in premature uh, babies we might be able to we might be doing what avulse the cord and tearing the cord by applying too much traction because the cord is thin and friable and such a situation can also be there if it is a 
dead fetus or dead fetus which has been dead for a prolonged time then that cord can also be very thin and friable and you know undergoing that decomposition and everything so that cord also so in a premature baby or when there is an IUD baby IUD baby also with for uh, IUD especially in a preterm dead baby or when the IUD has been dead baby has been retained for a considerable amount of time resulting in decomposition then the cord is expected to be thin and friable and can get evulsed if we apply controlled cord traction so in those cases only the fundal pressure method which is also called as the Creed's method also called as the Creed's method that can be used for delivery of the placenta otherwise in all other cases we do controlled cord traction question number 141 what is the procedure being performed called let me show you this picture here okay all right so what is this procedure being called it is being done under ultrasound guidance as you can see here a needle is inserted into the umbilical cord here into the umbilical cord and blood is aspirated what is this this is pubs what is pubs this is pubs pubs is i'll write down in a new sheet here the procedure is PUBS, it is percutaneous, percutaneous umbilical blood sampling. So remember percutaneous umbilical blood sampling done under ultrasound guidance. F from where is the sample being taken? Remember, this is also called as, also called as Chordosynthesis. Chordosynthesis is the same as PUBS. We are taking the blood sample from the umbilical vein. Okay? From the umbilical vein, not from the umbilical artery. If we prick the umbilical artery, if you prick the umbilical artery, at, it can result in a sudden reflex bradycardia. Right? And usually the site that is chosen to do this percutaneous umbilical vein sampling is near the attachment of the cord to the placenta because obviously when this is the placenta this is the cord the cord that is attaching at the level of placenta at this place there is this is the favored location of doing the sampling why because the stable the cord is stable here the cord is stable here if you have a free segment of cord then it is very difficult to uh, you know insert a needle in a floating cord so for technical reasons the uh, situation the position from where the umbilical vein is sampled is near the insertion to the placenta like that shown in the figure so technically it is easier to perform from there umbilical artery if accidentally pricked or sampled can result in sudden reflex bradycardia and can be detrimental to the fetus and this procedure chordosynthesis can be done from bit more than 18 weeks onwards okay it can be done from more than 18 weeks onwards and it is a very good test for doing karyotyping because what are we sampling the sample that is achieved is the fetal blood and from the fetal blood we can sample the RBCs and the WBCs and the WBCs are the dividing cells right and a fetal karyotype can be obtained okay we can obtain a fetal karyotype from these cells we can test the fetal blood group and RH status fetal blood group and RH status can be checked right and fetal karyotype can be used can be done so Another important aspect of this is we can test for fetal anemia. We can test for fetal anemia by directly estimating the Hb and the hematocrit of this blood.
blood. And when we do the intrauterine transfusion, IUT, intrauterine transfusion, that is also done via this route only, cordocentesis. Okay, so intrauterine transfusions can be done via this route. So this is important about cordocentesis. Remember this much. Let us move on to the next question here. Question number 142. A lady diagnosed with sputum positive tuberculosis, best management is. So, wait for second trimester to start ATT, category 1 ATT in first trimester or category 2 or category 3. So, we do very, very important to remember again category 1 ATT in first trimester itself. Okay, category 1 ATT in first trimester itself. Also remember some important points here that streptomycin. Streptomycin is contraindicated in pregnancy. Otherwise, the routine drugs which are used in category 1 ATT, which is HRZE, those are used. Okay, HRZE is used. The uh, rifampicin, parazinamide, ethambutol and um, rifampicin, parazinamide, ethambutol, they are all used, okay, but the streptomycin is contraindicated in pregnancy or the rest of the first line drugs can be given. So, we use start category 1 ATT in the first trimester itself, okay, do not wait for the second trimester. At any point in time in pregnancy, sputum positive TB is diagnosed, we start the treatment, all right. Next question, question number 143, all are true about Krukenberg's tumor except A, is it always secondary, B, is it most common primary is in the stomach, C, is it usually bilateral, D, signet ring cells are seen, alright. So, signet ring cells are the classic diagnostic criteria of a Krukenberg's tumor. A tumor cannot be called a Krukenberg's tumor if on histopathology there are no signet ring cells. So this is true statement. Usually bilateral. Now what exactly are Krukenberg's tumor? Krukenberg's tumor are metastatic tumors to the ovary. Metastatic tumors to the ovary. They are metastatic tumors to the ovary and the primary being somewhere else in the abdomen. The most common primary is from the stomach. That is also a true statement. So, usually they are bilateral. Usually, majority of the times these tumors are bilateral. They could be mono, uh, unilateral also. So, usually bilateral is true. But is it always secondary? Always is such a strong statement. Always. No, it is not always secondary. Okay, so it is not always, always secondary. This is the false statement. It may be, may be in certain circumstances, few cases, it may be a primary tumor from the ovary itself if it has signet ring cells. So, Krukenberg's tumor is basically an ovarian tumor which is metastatic from other abdominal sites, other abdominal organs. The characteristic feature is signet ring cells. They are usually bilateral, right? The most common primary is from the stomach, but they are metastatic, yes, of course, but they are not always metastatic. They can be a primary tumor can be a primary tumor also. And another fifth thing that you should remember, which is not in the options here, is that the capsule, the capsule of ovary is not breached. Most of the times, the capsule of the ovary is not breached by the tumor growth. The shape of the ovary is maintained. The shape of the ovary is maintained. This is another important point I want you to remember about Krukenberg's tumor. Next 
Now, what is next question? Question number 144. What is the clinical sign elicited? As we can see here, the clinical sign which is elicited is it is a bimanual PV examination is being performed. The two fingers are being opposed together, trying to be opposed together. This is the pregnancy in the upper segment. This is the cervix. This is the cervix here. And what is this part here? This part here which is being palpated is the isthmus. Right? So this is palpation of the thinning of the isthmus. Okay, the isthmus is very thin during pregnancy. The isthmus softens during pregnancy. So, softening of isthmus, this is the Hagar sign. So, this is the Hagar sign, which is basically softening of isthmus. What is Goodell signs? Goodell sign is basically softening of the cervix. The cervix, the pregnant cervix feels very soft that is called as Goodell sign. What is Osiander sign? Osiander signs are basically pulsations in the lateral vaginal fornix that is called as Osiander sign. So you know that in pregnancy vascularity to the uterus is increased. So the uterine arteries they increase in size, blood flows rapidly, more amount of blood flows through these uterine arteries and where are these uterine arteries located? These uterine arteries are located just above the lateral vaginal fornix that is where the at the level of the internal os that is where the uterine arteries come enter the uterus then go upwards and then go downwards so this portion this anatomical portion where the uterine arteries are going to be are palp uh, uh, enter is the uh, at the level of the internal os and the pulsations can be felt through these lateral vaginal fornix that is called as the osiander's sign Okay, now moving on to the next question, question number 145. Imiquimod is used for the treatment of, Imiquimod is basically, uh, you know, it is a class of drugs which is an immune modulator. Okay, it is a class of drug which is an immune modulator and it has been used for molluscum contagiosum, for warts and for skin cancers. So basically the answer, answer is all of the above. So it has been used for all of the above situations, but remember that this cannot be used in pregnancy. Okay, so this is pregnancy is a contraindication for the use of these drugs. So if you are asking me if another question that I can frame out of this question is basically which I want you to remember is that what's in pregnancy? Okay, if there are warts in pregnancy, then you do not treat by imiquimod. Okay, warts in pregnancy, we uh, the treatment is usually deferred most of the times. Usually, local treatment, um, we can use trichloroacetic acid that can be used. Uh, but not imiquimod, not imiquimod. Imiquimod is contra, imiquimod. Okay, so imiquimod is, is contraindicated in pregnancy. Now, next question, question number 146. Pain in early labor is transmitted through. The answer is T11 to T12. See, even if you don't remember anything about this question, it is very simple to understand pain in early labor when a woman in his early labor where is she complaining of pain over the abdomen right here all over the abdomen right here right where the fundus of the uterus is now this fundus of the uterus is somewhere in the upper abdomen side here in a term pregnancy so early labor is transmitted to through T11 to T12 segments corresponding to near around the umbilicus, right? Corresponding to the area near around the umbilicus. That is T11 to T12. So that is where a pain in early labor is transmitted to three segments. As the labor advances, as the labor advances, there is cervical dilatation. So pain during cervical dilatation. So let me just tell you pay about pain during labor. So, pain transmission during labor, the important points to remember, in early labor, 
pain is transmitted by the pain is transmitted by the overlying see the uterine musculature itself the uterine musculature itself does not uh, trans, uh, does not have pain fibers it is the overlying peritoneum it is the overlying peritoneum the visceral peritoneum of the uterus that transmits pain that has pain fibers okay so when the uterus contracts there is movement of the overlying peritoneum and that causes pain transmission and the supply of this peritoneum is from the t11 to l1 nerves so t11 to l1 nerves okay but in early labor preferentially it will be the t11 to t12 segment which uh, preferentially uh, <coughs> preferentially it will be from the t11 to t12 segments as we have answered in this question all right because uh, <coughs> but overall t11 to l1 nerves are in from this early labor so preferentially from the t11 to t12 segments right and the ganglion that is responsible is called as the frankenhauser ganglion the ganglion is the franken frankenhauser ganglion okay so basically the visceral fibers the visceral fibers from the uterus the cervix and the upper vagina they all are transmitted via this ganglion that is the frankenhauser ganglion okay then pain due to cervical dilatation pain because of cervical dilatation is transmitted via the sacral plexus okay sacral plexus via the pelvic splanchnic nerves pelvic splanchnic nerves all right so it is radiated to the back it is radiated to the back another important thing pain from the upper vagina pain from the upper vagina is transmitted via the pudendal nerve via the pudendal nerve all right so this is again important to remember from cervical dilatation it is the pelvic splanchnic nerves from the upper vagina it is the pudendal nerve mainly all right so these are the pain transmissions and also remember also remember that when we give epidural analgesia when we give epidural analgesia for pain relief when we give epidural analgesia for pain relief the level of block should be the level of block should be t10 when we give the level of block at t10 level we ensure that everything below t10 level remains anesthetized right and the pain fibers the topmost level is the t10 it is t10 to l2 right t10 to l1 for the uterine origin of the pain and for this pain due to cervical dilatation this is s1 s2 s3 pelvic splanchnic nerves right so when we give an epidural analgesia for pain relief and maintain the level of block at t10 level all the types of pains are taken care of pain from cervical dilatation pain from uterine contractions pain from the upper vagina everything is taken care of while doing giving this epidural level of block at t10 but if you have to give an epidural anesthesia but if you have to give an epidural or spinal anesthesia for a cesarean section then the level of block is t4 not t10 because the parietal peritoneum of the anterior abdominal wall parietal peritoneum of the abdomen the parietal peritoneum should also be anesthetized because now we are going to incise the peritoneum to reach the 
a uterus. So parietal peritoneum in addition needs to be anesthetized. So we have to increase the level of the block till T4 level. Okay. That's about pain relief. Question number 147. Identify the gynecological instrument shown below. Now this instrument is a rocket endocervical brush. It is a rocket endocervical brush. Okay. It is not an eye spatula. It is not a cervical brush. It's an endocervical brush. Obviously, it's not a wooden spatula. So this is a rocket endocervical brush. And this basically, it is something like this. This um, Okay, so this is what it is. Basically, we take sample from the endocervix also, take sample from the ectocervix also like this. It is introduced and this is useful to take sample for the sample for the liquid based cytology liquid based cytology when we do for the cervical cancer screening we use this uh, brush okay rocket endocervical brush it can take sample it is introduced inside moved 90 degrees rotated 90 degrees like this so we are able to take sample from the endocervix as well as from the ectocervix that is called as the rocket endocervical brush Moving on to next question, question number 148. Okay. Name the condition. This is we are doing question number 148. Name the condition shown in the image. Now, this is a cyst on the vulva. We can see this cyst on the vulva. And this cyst is a Bartholin cyst. This cyst is a Bartholin cyst. Okay. So, Nebothian cyst and chocolate cyst, these are two completely ruled out, okay. These two options are completely ruled out. A Nebothian cyst is present on the cervix. A chocolate cyst is an endometriotic cyst which is present on the ovary. The Gartner cyst, some people you might be confused whether it is a Bartholin cyst, whether it is a Gartner cyst. So, it is not a Gartner cyst because this cyst is clearly, you can see this cyst at the vulva and just underneath the labia majora, okay. Just underneath the labia majora, this is the labia minora and we are seeing this cyst here. This is the labia majora here, okay. And just underneath the labia majora is the location of this cyst. Gartner cyst on the other hand is a cyst arising from the Gartner's duct. Okay, now this Gartner's duct actually travels alongside the lateral wall of vagina. Lateral wall of vagina, this is the Gartner's cyst. So, this Gartner's duct. This Gartner's duct is a remnant of the mesonephric duct. Okay, and this Gartner's duct cyst can arise in the lateral wall of vagina. Okay, this cyst is hardly ever seen. This, this cyst, Gartner's duct cyst will not be visible externally on the vulva, period. Okay, this Gartner's cyst is arising from the Gartner's duct. This duct travels along the lateral wall of the vagina. So, if at all at any point in time there is a cyst in this Gartner's duct leading to a Gartner's duct cyst, that will be seen in the vagina. After opening, after the per speculum examination, it is seen through the vaginal side. So, this cyst will be present in the vagina in the anterolateral location. It will not be seen in the vulva like this. So, a vulva, a cyst which is seen on the vulva, this is the Bartholin's cyst. Okay. Next question, question number 149. In obstetrics ultrasound, commonly employed range of frequency is A, 3.525 megahertz. So, this is a very clear cut question. This is the commonly employed range of frequency which is used in the transabdominal 
which is used in the trans abdominal USG that is 3.5 to 5 mega hertz. Moving on to the next question, question number 150, identify the instrument shown below. Now this instrument is the cervical biopsy forceps. This is the end, this is a cervical biopsy forceps and uh, it's a punch biopsy forceps. It's a punch biopsy forceps and the tenaculum and valsalum on the other hand are instruments which are used to hold the cervix okay these are instruments which are used to hold the cervix those are the tenaculum and valsalum valsalum it is not an eb curate eb curate is a straight instrument which has a curate like end to take endometrial sample so this, these are not the instruments question number 151 which of the following is true regarding fertilization and implantation? So which of the following is true? Let us go uh, statement wise. Morula is covered by trophoblast. Is it true? Now when it morula is not covered by trophoblast, what is morula? There is a zygote. First after fertilization a zygote is formed. The zygote undergoes cleavage mitosis and then results in a morula. Morula is still a collection of cells, okay. These cells have yet not differentiated into an inner cell mass and a trophoblast. Once the cells differentiate into an inner cell mass and a trophoblast, it is no longer a morula, it becomes a blastocyst. So the morula is not covered by trophoblast, this is a false statement, okay. Haploid cells formation in both. This is also a false statement. Once the zygote is formed, there is so haploid cell formation in both. That is false statement. In fertilization, what is happening? From haploid cells, a diploid organism is resulting. Okay. So haploid cell formation is the false statement. Morula is actively motile in oviducts. No, neither is the morula actively motile in oviducts nor is the blastocyst actively motile. So this is the false statement. Beta HCG secretions are secreted by trophoblast. This is the true statement. So D is the true statement. So let me just give you a brief, brief about the uh, implantation and processes. So just remember here that when the fertilization takes place, we get a zygote, we call it a conceptus, okay, we call it a conceptus and the zygote then divides into the morula, okay, and 8 cell stage is also morula, 16 cell stage is also morula, but it is the 8 celled morula on day 4 of fertilization it enters the uterine cavity so the morula it stays inside the tube for a period of 3 days okay during those 3 days the morula is traversing the journey from the ampulla Fertilization has taken place in the ampulla of the tube. From the ampulla of the tube, the morula has to come enter the uterine cavity. This movement of conceptus, this movement of conceptus is brought about by the, mainly by the tubal peristalsis, mainly by the tubal peristalsis and aided, helped supported the second line is the ciliary motion motion of the cilia in the tube okay the tubal epithelium is ciliated columnar right so that ciliary motion the cilia beat towards the uterine cavity so movement of conceptus is conceptus in itself morula has no uh, motility it is mainly the tubal peristalsis supported by the ciliary action 
of the cilia that the marula is transported towards the uterine end and then it is the eight celled marula on day 4 of fertilization enters the uterine cavity and then on day 5 and then on day 5 what happens this marula the zygote everything is still surrounded by the zona pellucida on day 5 we have a blastocyst this blastocyst undergoes zona hatching comes out of the zona now and after that implantation implantation happens between day 6 to day 10 of fertilization so implantation begins on day 6 and is completed by day 10 okay and in humans we have this interstitial implantation interstitial implantation very very important to remember interstitial implantation all right the decidua grows over the uh, uh, covers the um, you know um, endometrial end of the uh, embryo the cavity the cavitary uh, end of the embryo that is called as the implantation the embryo is covered by the decidua that is interstitial implantation so basically decidua regrows over the end uh, this is the decidua regrows over the uh, burrowing uh, blastocyst burrowing embryo and uh, therefore implantation is not does not uh, it does not implantation does not happen over one day the embryo starts burrowing and that begins on the day 6 of fertilization and the whole process gets completed by day 10 of fertilization so that is important to remember now moving on to the next question false about ohss what is ohss ohss is the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome okay what is ohss ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome let me give you before going into the options let me just tell you why ohss happens if you understand when we do ivf we we big, want to begin not by obtaining one or two follicles we want to have many follicles 17 18 19 20 follicles we want to begin with anything more than 12 10 we are happy so we want many follicles so this is we are doing hyperstimulation right but what we are doing in ivf and what we are trying to achieve is controlled ovarian hyperstimulation so i want to do ovarian hyperstimulation yes but i don't want to end up in an ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome i want to do a controlled ovarian hyperstimulation controlled ovarian hyperstimulation for which i use drugs like gonadotropins gnr channel logs and a combination of the two so i do a controlled ovarian hyperstimulation sometimes what happens that the when the ovary the, when the all the ovarian follicles are responding the ovary uh, is responding to the drugs the gonadotropins or the gonadotropin hormone analogs that gnrh analogs that are going being used what happens is that the ovarian stroma also increases in size it is not just that the follicles develop if the follicles develop the surrounding stroma also develops all right so there is a very thin line separating controlled ovarian hyperstimulation and ovarian hyperstimulation okay so at times when we are doing controlled ovarian hyperstimulation when the dosages exceed the required amounts then we can end up doing uh, end up in an ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome so what is it associated with it is associated with massive stromal edema of the ovary this is a true statement okay this is true statement it is associated with massive stromal edema of the ovary the enlarged ovaries may be prone to torsion so if there is massive stromal edema if there are 20 25 follicles an ovary which was this small in size end up getting this big in size right now this small ovary is connected to the this small ovary is connected to the uterus via the ovarian ligament okay now when the bulk of the ovary increases when the weight of this ovary increases and it is attached to the small uterus now with a thin ovarian ligament this ovary because of its weight can tort on that ligament right so that enlarged ovaries may become prone to torsion that is also a 
true statement. Patients with OHHS usually have enlarged ovaries more than 10 centimeters. Normal ovaries only about 3 centimeters. It enlarges to as much as more than 10 centimeters that may contain several hypoechoic areas. Hypoechoic areas, why? Because of the follicles which appear hypoechoic. So this is also a true statement. The symptoms associated with OHSS usually begin 15 to 20 days after HCG, ex ex HCG injection. This is the false statement. This is the false statement. The symptoms actually begin, uh, you know, uh, the symptoms actually begin, uh, be be begin three to four days after giving this HCG injection. Okay. Because HCG in itself, which we are giving for trigger, for uh, we are giving HCG injection in this uh, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation to trigger the meiosis, all right, as an ovulation trigger, we are giving HCG. And when we give HCG, it also acts to stimulate the ovaries and the ovarian stroma also. So it contributes to ovarian hyperstimulation, all right. So just in brief about of some important points to remember about OHHS, this is a very, very important uh, question. They have asked, uh, now they have asked for the last, uh, they have asked two times this question in a variety of exams in the last five years, okay. So OHS is an important topic. So ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome happens because of the um, stromal edema and hyperplasia because of the stromal edema and growth of hyper uh, stromal edema which happens because of the growth of ovary and follicles in response to the okay this happens in response to the gonadotropins okay and because of these what happens there is the vascular and angiogenic factors, they are released, a variety of vascular and angiogenic factors are released and the most important of those factors is the vascular endothelial growth factor and this is the main factor which contributes to the capillary permeability. There is an increase in capillary permeability. And this factor seeps into the general circulation from the ovaries and there is increased capillary permeability which is going to lead to the variety of sim symptoms which come with the uh, ovarian hyperstimulation. So on the one hand there is increased capillary permeability, on the other hand the ovaries are now large and bulky with stretching of the ovarian capsule causing pain abdomen causing the possibility of torsion of the ovaries and acute abdomen and this increased permeability contributes to hemoconcentration, can lead to pulmonary edema, can lead to ascites and as the severity of this condition will rise, it can be very, very life threatening to the woman. It can be life threatening to the woman as well and very, very important to remember what is the timing of this ovarian hyperstimulation, it happens usually 3 to 6 days after HCG injection because HCG itself also contributes to ovarian stimulation. So 3 to 6 days after HCG is given. So this is the first time in the cycle that OHS can result and it can also later on it can worsen if the woman conceives because if the woman conceives there is going to be beta HCG from the pregnancy itself, beta HCG, rise in beta HCG from the pregnancy itself, from the trophoblast itself. So later on the second time that it can happen is if the woman conceives and if it had been there earlier it can worsen at this point in time. So this is about the timing of the uh, OHS. What is the management? The management is, uh, uh, you know, sometimes the management is, 
the management concentrates on basically two lines. One is prevention of OHHS and the other is obviously treatment. So when we talk about prevention, uh, prevention can be done by, uh, you know, uh, by withholding HCG or cycle cancellation. Okay, so supposing we are doing IVF, all right, and I feel that the woman has, have, has, is having a lot of follicles and she has the probability of uh, having, uh, you know, uh, she has the probability of developing uh, OHHS, okay. If I feel that the, I'm getting too many follicles and uh, she is having a very enlarged ovaries, a very high levels of estradiol, I can suspect that if I give her HCG injection, she can have OHSS, that it can be very life-threatening and damaging. So I can withhold the HCG or cycle and then, you know, withhold the HCG for a few days or I could do a cycle cancellation and start another cycle the next time with a lower dosages of gonadotropin. So that is just one line I want to tell you here. Withholding or HCG cancellation can be done. If we are doing treatment wise, then on treatment we have to have a conservative management only. So the management is conservative. Conservative management by analgesics, IV fluids to counter the dehydration, to counter the hemoconcentration, to counter the uh, and rest. That, that is all. That is what we can give. But uh, the problem is in, with such a woman is that if she has OHSS and she has to improve with this conservative management, okay, the mild type of OHSS can respond. But if it's a very severe type of OHSS and most of the times women end up losing their pregnancies. We have to terminate the pregnancies. And if there is a severe pulmonary edema, ascites, maybe tap, ascitic tapping, maybe ventilatory support. So it can be a, it can be a potentially life-threatening condition where the only treatment management we are left with is terminating that precious pregnancy, right? So as IVF people who are practicing IVF, we feel that it is very, it is better to prevent OHHS rather than, you know, end up with OHSS and then dealing with it, okay? Uh, so that is in a nutshell about OHSS. Moving to the next question. Question number 153. Oxytocin challenge test for assessing fetal well-being is contraindicated in all except. So, where will you not do, uh, where will you, where can you do the uh, oxytocin challenge test? What is oxytocin challenge test? Basically, to answer this question, you should know what oxytocin challenge test is. It is hardly done clinically nowadays, but yes, questions are asked on this. So, oxytocin challenge test is basically, we give an oxytocin infusion. We ensure that the woman is term. We start an oxytocin infusion and then what do we do? Start initiate certain amount of contractions. When contractions are initiated, what do we do next? We see, we see the cardiotrochography, we see the trace, all right? So we put her on cardiotrochography machine, start the oxytocin infusion, give her a few contractions, let her have a few contractions. That is what the challenge is. How does she respond to those contractions? So along with those contractions, we see the fetal heart rate pattern. So if the fetal heart rate is all good, all right, no problem, that is called as the oxytocin challenge test that the woman is bearing contractions and the fetal heart rate is not deteriorating with the contractions. So that is what is oxytocin challenge test. So to be able to do an oxytocin challenge test, the prime requirement is that if by that challenge, she actually goes into labor, then that should be allowable, isn't it? When I'm giving a challenge, oxytocin challenge to a woman and initiating contractions in her, then I should be, there should be a clear cut indication and there should be a clear cut plan of action. What if while giving this challenge, she actually goes into labor, then the labor should be allowable. So obviously, will you do it in a placenta previa? Start giving oxytocin to a woman of placenta previa because when you give oxytocin, she will go into labor or with the initiation of contraction, she will start bleeding. So obviously, placenta previa is a contraindication. 
previous to cesarean i don't want a previous to cesarean woman to have any contractions contraindication premature labor why will i want to give contractions to a woman who has a premature fetus preterm i want her to not go into labor so contraindication breach i can do this oxytocin challenge test now we have better test we have cardio tachography we have nst we have biophysical profile we have ultrasound available we don't don't really go for this oxytocin challenge test anymore question number 154 which of the following includes the classical triad of enlarged upper part of uterus false lower part of body and firm cervix during early pregnancy we've just discussed it soft lower part of body and isthmus and firm cervix and enlarged upper part of the uterus the lower part is of the cervix is firm in between there is softening of the lower part of the body of uterus that involves the isthmus this is the hagar sign so we'll move ahead with this next question question number 155 true regarding squamous carcinoma of the cervix includes all except so let us go one by one squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix occurs at the squamocolumnar junction this is also a true statement type 16 and 18 hpv are implicated as causative organisms this is also a true statement the most common presenting feature is post coital bleeding this is also a true statement okay so the common presenting feature is irregular vaginal bleeding post coital bleeding in early stages you know it could be a post coital bleeding only ct scanning is the best recommended modality for staging now okay there is a change there is a change ct scanning now this is an old question okay this is an old question which has been given to you as such ct scanning is allowed okay but it is still it is it it cannot be said that it is the best recommended mortality so it i would still go uh, for this statement as the false statement ct scanning is now allowed ct scanning is now allowed okay ct scanning is now allowed for staging of cervical cancer by ct scanning we are able to see the lymph nodes enlarged lymph nodes okay but to see the enlarged lymph nodes ct is just one modality okay it we have even mri is allowed so if i want to see the depth of cervical invasion for example what happens in a cervical cancer a cervical let me just give you an explanation for this answer what happens in a cervical cancer cervical cancer begins from the cervix and then it has two routes of spread it can spread via the lymphatics to the lymph nodes and it can spread by direct spread to the adjacent structures so where does it go the upper spread to the uterus is disregarded it goes deep 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 stromal in uh, stromal invasion right or it can go become a cauliflower like growth uh, extending eating up the entire cervix and from there it goes into the vagina and from there it goes into the parametrium right then from the vagina then the lower one third of the vagina and then from the parametrium to the short of the lateral pelvic wall and all the way up to the lateral pelvic wall that is how the cervical cancer is going to spread now if i want to check for the the clinical staging which was done earlier in the clinical staging which was done earlier we used we used to do a per vaginal rectal examination and elicit whether the uterosacrals were involved how far the parametrium was involved right so that was what was the clinical staging now they are saying that other other procedures are also allowed so with the everything is allowed ct is allowed mri is allowed and proctoscopy and cystoscopy which was allowed earlier also that is also allowed right ultrasound is allowed fnac biopsy of these enlarged lymph nodes that is also allowed all right so ct will only tell me that the lymph nodes are enlarged whether they are enlarged because of the tumor or it is a reactive inflammatory enlargement associated with cancer that it doesn't tell me right if i want to see the 
parametrum involvement to see the vaginal involvement, the soft tissue demarcation is better with MRI. So I will do a clinical examination first and if I want to find out whether the parametria or whether the vagina is involved, I would prefer an MRI. If the ultrasound or CT scan is showing enlarged lymph nodes, I will go for a PET scanning is much, much better because PET scanning will exactly tell me whether there are tumor deposits in the lymph nodes or not. So a variety of investigations are allowed now for staging of cervical cancer. And it is a composite staging. It is not like CT scanning is the best recommended modality of staging. It will depend upon what I want to find out. If I want to find out a parametral or a lymph node, a uh, parametral or a vaginal involvement, want to concentrate on the soft tissues, I would probably want to, uh, MRI would be a better investigation. If I want to see the lymph nodes, right, enlarged lymph nodes, then CT scanning is one modality, yes, of course, better. But obviously, F. Uh, this thing PET scanning is very, very, uh, uh, very, very good and better than CT. But the problem with PET scan is availability and cost. So a lot of things. So all these investigations are allowed. Now it is a composite stage staging. The primary part of the staging is still the clinical examination. Earlier investigations like CT, MRI, FNA biopsy of these lymph nodes, they were not allowed. Now everything is allowed. But that doesn't mean that CT is the best recommended modality for staging. So option number D is still false. Okay, but CT is definitely allowed now. Question number 156. In a perimenopausal woman, amenorrhea for a period of time followed by sudden bleeding per vaginum is due to metropathia hemorrhagica. It is because of metropathia hemorrhagica. Now, metropathia hemorrhagica is an old discarded term. It was basically an ovulatory DUB. What is ovulatory DUB means dysfunctional uterine bleeding where the uterus was normal. There was no uh, uterine pathology. There was no ovarian pathology. It was simply that there were anovulatory cycles. And in anovulatory cycles, the classic pattern is that there is uh, oligomenorrhea for a couple of months. And then when bleeding happens, it is excessive and prolonged in duration. That is metropathia hemorrhagica. And uh, another thing that they have asked uh, a number of times is the histopathological findings which are seen in metropathia hemorrhagica that is called as cystic glandular hyperplasia. In this cystic glandular hyperplasia what happens that there is loss of secretory and corkscrew pattern loss of secretory and corkscrew pattern this has also been asked okay so this is important move on to the next question question number 157 okay there is we have to read this question let us see this okay you are delivering a 26 year old multigravida, third gravida para 2 at 40 weeks, okay. She has a history of two previous uncomplicated vaginal deliveries, has no complications in this pregnancy. After 15 minutes of pushing, I think they want to ask head. Head retracts back against the perineum. As you apply gently downward traction to the head, the baby's anterior shoulder fails to deliver. So all this long story cut short, she is a multigravida, absolutely normal pregnancy, no other risk factors, not in the past history, not in the current pregnancy, but the shoulders fail to deliver. So that is shoulder dystocia. All of the following are appropriate next steps in management of this patient are except instruct the nurse to apply fundal pressure that is one thing that you will never never do no push from above no pull from below if you pull from below we are pulling the neck like this and the baby can have brachial plexus injury that is the most common type of injury that can result in the fetus after shoulder dystocia is a brachial plexus injury and it happens because of the faulty maneuvers, faulty things, faulty practices that one that one does. So never push from above. Pushing from above hinges the hinges the uh, shoulder even further. 
okay obstructs the shoulder even further so that is something that you will never ever do so this fundal pressure is not done cut a generous episiotomy yes you will do this instruct the nurse to apply supra pubic pressure here to flex the to adduct the shoulders yes supra pubic pressure is given instruct the nurse to flex the patient's leg back to her head what does that mean leg back to her head okay no acrobatics okay it is simply meaning the simply meaning flex the thighs over the chest okay flex the thighs over the abdomen that is mac roberts maneuver abduction of the adduction of the sorry flexion of the thigh hyperflexion of the thigh and abduction of the thigh so what are we doing we are doing hyperflexion and abduction of the thigh that is the mac roberts maneuver so these are the things that are done whenever shoulder dystocia happens call for help ask the sister to apply supra pubic pressure then the other sister is going to go for this mac robert maneuver you are standing and delivering the baby but please do not pull the head no pulling from below no pushing from above these are the things that are done okay moving on to the next question question number 140 158 here a young girl presents with primary amenorrhea primary amenorrhea grade 5 thilarchy what is grade 5 thilarchy is thilarchy is breast uh, development okay the grades of thilarchy are there uh, grade 1 uh, is prepubertal grade 2 is remember just grade 2 grade 2 is breast budding if i say grade 3 grade 4 they are just increasing levels of breast development grade 5 is full adult breasts grade 2 pubarchy so pubic hair are also there pubertal pubic hair are going uh, through as nicely no axillary hair okay grade 2 pubarchy grade 2 pubarchy is like pubarchy is just there you know not much so hardly any pubic hair development no axillary hair development the most probable diagnosis is primary amenorrhea good breasts no pubic hair almost nil pubic hair no axillary hair just one diagnosis and that is testicular feminization that is androgen insensitivity syndrome another name for androgen insensitivity syndrome so let me just give you a brief about the approach to such questions how are we going to talk about the approach to questions where we are dealing with um, primary amenorrhea very very important so whenever there is primary amenorrhea the next thing that we see is about the secondary sexual characteristics see the secondary sexual characteristics by secondary sexual characteristics i mainly mean the breasts so if the breasts are present obviously they are present sorry well developed and if there are prepubertal okay prepubertal breasts so if the breasts are well developed the next thing that you have to see if there is history of cryptomenorrhea if there is history of cryptomenorrhea there can be two possibilities either it is an imperforate hymen what is cryptomenorrhea hidden menses so she will have history of having a, a pain abdomen cyclically every month on a particular specific days monthly pain abdomen but there is no visible external bleeding so with an imperforate hymen what can be there there can be collection of blood in the vagina and because the hymen it can be can be a bluish bulge at the hymen can be seen so bluish bulge at hymen that is imperforate hymen then there can the other possibility is a transverse vaginal septum now a transverse vaginal septum unlike an imperforate hymen hymen is just on the just above the introitus 
whereas the transfer in vaginal septum is much higher. It is most commonly in the upper part of the vagina, right? So a bulge is not seen on the outside. What happens? Blood collects posteriorly. So there can be a hemato colpos in the upper part, whatever part of vagina is left, then the hematometra. So such uh, young girls can have a transverse vaginal septum and that will be, um, they can be per abdominal mass also because of the enlarged uh, uterus. So this is one scenario. The other scenario is that if the question says breast presence and there is a blind vaginal pouch. Okay, there is just a blind vaginal pouch and if the question says that on ultrasound or whatever investigation, the uterus is absent. Okay, blind vaginal pouch or the uterus is absent, there can be two possibilities. Okay, see if the pubic hair are present normally and see if the pubic hair are scanty. So if the pubic hair are scanty, the diagnosis is androgen insensitivity syndrome. But if the pubic hair is normal, the diagnosis is Mullerian agenesis. But remember that in such a situation, the definitive diagnosis, the definitive diagnosis can be made only by karyotype. Okay. Also remember that in Mullerian agenesis, the gonads are ovaries. And in androgen insensitivities, the gonads are testes. Right? These testes are going to produce androgens. That is why these androgens get converted into the by the enzyme aromatase in the periphery to estrogen responsible for the breast development in such women. But since there are no testosterone receptors, pubic hair are not developing. So that is about the androgen insensitivity syndrome. These testicular gonads, these gonads which are testes, they could be intra-abdominal or they could be an inguinal hernia. So a young girl with inguinal hernia the gonad could be a testes lying in the inguinal area. So always rule out androgen insensitivity syndrome. Okay, now in this androgen insensitivity syndrome, also remember that androgen insensitivity syndrome has the worst, has the worst reproductive outcome. Why? The gonads are testes, there is no uterus, there is no ovaries. So, Adoption is the only option for such women. Adoption is the only option. Adoption is the only option. Whereas with Mullerian agenesis, the gonads are ovaries. They do not have a functional uterus inside. So what can we do? Surrogacy. They can use their ova and they have surrogacy is an option for these women. Also remember, it is very important to do a karyotype in such a situation because in androgen insensitivity, the what is the karyotype? The karyotype is XY. Because of the presence of this Y and the gonads being testes, there is probability, possibility of a gonadoblastoma. So a gonadectomy is done. And question has been asked, when is this gonadectomy done? The gonadectomy is done. Once pubertal development is complete, once pubertal development is complete, then it is done or at the age of 18 years, if nothing is given like this, if the statement like pubertal development complete is not given, then we choose 18 years. And in this Mullerian agenesis, the karyotype is 46XX. If that is sure, then we do not require a gonadectomy for these women. The gonads are ovaries, they are normal ovaries, so that is not done. So gonadectomy is not done in this case. Okay, so this was about, so this was about, so this flowchart was about an approach to primary amenorrhea with well-developed breasts. If there was a history of cryptomenorrhea, it could be an imperforate hymen or a transverse vaginal septum. If there is a blind vaginal pouch, we will see whether the pubic hair are present or scanty. If they are scanty, our diagnosis is androgen insensitivity. If they are normal, our diagnosis is Mullerian agenesis. And this is in brief about the 
two conditions, the very, very important points to remember. Then the other situation which we did not talk about, which was the other arm was primary amenorrhea, primary amenorrhea with absent breasts development. Okay, if there is primary amenorrhea with absent breast development, you see what is the height of the woman. If the height is tall, there could be two situations, Coleman and it could be a gonadal dysgenesis. Okay, among the colmen and the gonadal dysgenesis, colmen is a commoner condition. Okay, colmen is a commoner condition. But remember colmen, there is GnRH deficiency. Okay, so what happens in this case, the LH and FSH is low. But in gonadal dysgenesis, the LH and FSH is high. What kind of gonadal dysgenesis? There can be pure gonadal dysgenesis or mixed gonadal dysgenesis. Swiver syndrome with 46 XY gonadal dysgenesis is a type of pure gonadal dysgenesis where LH and FSH levels are going to be high. So height is tall, breast development is absent. Okay, so this is about, this is in short about that. If the height is short, then there can be two situations. It could be a Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome in addition will have the, st the stigmata that is associated with Turner syndrome. The various points about Turner syndrome, web neck, shield like chest and uh, low posterior hairline. And then obviously a karyotype will confirm the diagnosis. And we can have constitutional. In Turner's, the LHFSH levels is again going to be high, right? So in Turner's, the ovaries are not developing. It is 45 XO, so there is streak ovaries. So streak ovaries are there. Turner's is also a, uh, is a type of gonadal dysgenesis. So what will happen? The LHFS is going to be raised. In constitutional, the LH and FSH is going to be decreased and ultimately constitutional is a diagnosis of exclusions. When you, once you have excluded all the other causes of primary amenorrhea with absent breast, constitutional is the last thing that you diagnose as a diagnosis of exclusion. All right. So this is about the flow chart here, absent breast development with primary amenorrhea. If the height is maintained, it could be either colmen or gonadal dysgenesis. One way to go about differentiating the two would be to do an LHFSH levels. If the height is short, then we have Turner's or constitutional. With Turner's, the st st various other stigmata of Turner's will be present and the LHFSH will be raised, but the diagnosis will, confirmed, will be confirmed only after doing a karyotype in such situations, okay? Moving on to the next question, question number 159. Regarding bone mineralization, which is the correct statement for a woman with osteoporosis and no problems of hot flushes? Okay, so regarding bone mineralization, which is the correct statement for a woman with osteoporosis and no problems of hot flushes? So the menopausal status has not been given. So she has, we do not know if she's menopausal or no, but what we do know is that she has osteoporosis. Progesterone therapy, as it is known for maintaining the osteoblastic action and thus bone formation. Estrogen and progesterone therapy for best results in bone formation. Bisphosphonates are equally effective as estrogen in bone formation or progesterone only therapy. So we know that actually progesterone has no effect on bone mineralization. Progesterone has no effect on bone mineralization. So any option which is giving you progesterone is out of the question. So this is not there, this is not there. Progesterone does not have a role in bone mineralization. Estrogen has a role in bone mineralization. Estrogen improves, increases, potentiates bone mineralization. So. Estrogen 
estrogen in a woman in a normal woman estrogen prevents her bones from demineralization okay so estrogen promotes mineralization after menopause when the woman's body does not have estrogen then bone demineralization can take place especially so if she has not taken enough amount of calcium and her been bone mineralization is not good to begin with then such women when they go through post menopause they do not fare well they lose their bone mineral density all right so after menopause because of lack of estrogen there can be loss of bone mineral density which can be severe enough in certain women to lead to osteoporosis okay so what was see hormone replacement therapy if a post menopausal woman takes hormone replacement therapy okay that is estrogen okay that is estrogen main which part of the hormone replacement therapy estrogen all right so all the if all the the requirement after menopause is not that of progesterone it is mainly of estrogen to prevent the hot flashes to prevent the bone mineral density to preserve the bone mineral density we need estrogen but if we give estrogen after menopause alone it will lead to endometrial hyperplasia so we want to add progesterone to the hrt component along with estrogen so whenever the uterus is present and we have to give estrogen as a replacement the requirement is of estrogen but we have to add progesterone because we don't want that while we are promoting bone growth and while we are promoting sorry bone not bone growth bone mineralization so while we are promoting bone mineralization and we are preventing hot flashes we end up giving endometrial hyperplasia so that is why estrogen progesterone given together the role is of estrogen all right this helps in preventing osteoporosis so hrt when you give it is useful for preventing osteoporosis preventing osteoporosis and this hrt is used for treatment of hot flashes all right but if osteoporosis has already set in like in this case a woman with osteoporosis then bisphosphonates are the treatment of choice for osteoporosis which has already set in the treatment of choice is bisphosphonates not hrt oh sorry okay so hrt is used for treatment of for so hrt is useful in preventing osteoporosis it is used for treatment for hot flashes but when osteoporosis has already occurred then the treatment of choice is bisphosphonates and bisphosphonates are equally effective as estrogen in bone formation this is the correct statement estrogen and progesterone therapy for best results in bone formation no so once hr osteoporosis is already there we don't give estrogen for treatment okay estrogen is good for preventing osteoporosis now moving on to the next question question number 160 a woman at 7 weeks of gestation came with complaints of vaginal spotting for the past 2 days okay so she is 7 weeks vaginal spotting for the past 2 days with dull aching pain in the lower abdomen a transvaginal sonography was performed and the gestational sac is 3 cm so you can see that this is a 3 cm gestational sac she is already 7 weeks yet there is no embryo no yolk sac that is seen inside so this is a so this is a blighted ovum this is blighted ovum was earlier called as an embryonic pregnancy okay by 7 weeks there should at least be a yolk sac there should be an embryo inside there should be a cardiac activity so this is not a normal intrauterine pregnancy it is not an ectopic pregnancy either neither is the clinical finding suggestive of an ectopic pregnancy and neither is the ultrasound showing any other uh, adnexal mass it's not an incomplete abortion the clinical finding is not such and the entire gestational sac is still inside so it is a blighted ovum or an an embryonic pregnancy question number 161 identify the fetal attitude fetal normal attitude of fetus is all flexion the head is completely flexed 
so that the smaller diameters and the suboccipitopragmatic diameter is the presenting diameter. In this case, what is happening that the head is, this is complete flexion, this is deflection and this is straight, this is and this is extension. Now this in between state where the head is in between complete flexion and complete extension, that is called as the <coughs> military position. This military position is something in between the complete flexion so that the neck is straight okay the neck is straight it is in between complete flexion and complete extension so this is military position <clears throat> so this finishes off the um, explanation all right